A very good evening to all of you. Namaste. And thank you for the warm welcome in Princeton. <laughs> I'm so touched because these are all citadels of great learning. And um, in the Indian spiritual tradition, we have always revered all forms of knowledge. Every form of knowledge can take you to the knowledge of what we call Brahma Vidya, if it is penetrated into. It's like that. So Vivekananda always wanted that universities should be uh, points where we are able to discuss the deepest uh, truths and the existential questions of life. So, and I'm really glad that so many of you are interested in the topic art of spiritual practice, sadhana. And I should thank Vinit Chandraji for selecting this topic. So I'm uh, going to dwell into very, I'm going to go very deep into the spiritual practices as we have them in yoga philosophy and in Vedant. So when I use the word yoga, I actually mean the meditative practice and the yoga philosophy. I don't mean those asanas and, you know, those physical exercises. And by Vedanta, of course, I mean the Vedanta philosophy. So we will go in deep into the spiritual practices given to us by these two philosophies. But as an introduction, I would like to give you one beautiful incident from the life of Sri Ramakrishna. Many of you, I'm, I'm sure, have uh, read his life and known that um, the state of God consciousness in which he lived, it's so touching when you see a practical demonstration of what we are going to discuss like that in a, in a human body. And he, he was constantly in the state of samadhi. And from that state, he gave out some very deep, very elevating truths about the nature of human consciousness and human life, which I'm sure all of, all of you are very interested in. So this incident especially occurred when Narendranath was in Sri Ramakrishna's room in Dakshineshwar. Narendranath, as you know, was the future Vivekananda. So when he was a young lad and at the feet, feet of the master, he was uh, sitting in front of Sri Ramakrishna and Sri Ramakrishna suddenly told him, my son, when will you realize God? When will you know the nature of the supreme truth? And then he said, he, he gave a, a very powerful example. He said, suppose I give you a cup of sweet syrup and suppose you were a fly, how would you taste that syrup? And Narendranath said, why, I would sit at the edge of the cup and stick my neck out and uh, lick the nectar and thus I would taste it because if I go deep into it, I would drown. And then Sri Ramakrishna said, but my son, this is not something in which you will drown. If you dive into this nectar, the nectar of immortality, the nectar of pure consciousness, you will become immortal. You will become immortal. So what is this diving into the nectar of immortality? What does it mean? What does dissolving into consciousness mean? The very nature of spiritual experiences, you know by being. You can't know it as an object because it's your own consciousness. How can you know it as an object? You can never know it like that. But you can be it. You can so deepen your awareness that you can become of the nature of pure consciousness. So this is when you dissolve into the cup of immortality. You become immortal. Sri Ramakrishna used to say, by thinking of consciousness, can one become unconscious? <laughs> you know... <laughs> Many times we, we do these extensive classes on uh, scriptures like Atma Bodh, Upanishads, Panchadashi, all this. And then the day when I have two, three classes on these subjects, I'm telling you, I can't sleep that night. I get sleep only after uh, one o'clock or two o'clock or something like that. It's such a strange phenomenon. Later I understood it's only because we are discussing pure awareness. And when you do two, three classes in a day, your mind is, even just to dwell on it mentally, gives you this experience. And what to speak of when your consciousness actually becomes one with that divine consciousness or dissolves into it. 
you are one with brahman so what is the nature of the practice that takes us into experiences like these this is what we are going to study in the art of spiritual practice because it's a very moot point you know the buddha used to say the buddha would say that it is the absolutely clear mind scintillating with awareness that is the key to the ultimate reality the absolutely clear mind scintillating with awareness that is the gateway to whatever we are calling the reality in uh, spiritual life so how do we generate these states you see it is a state where not just you experience full consciousness the purest consciousness but you also experience immense bliss an absolutely radiant form of attention and bliss which is so palpable to people who are around these great masters so you can i can cite the example of jesus on the cross even in that very painful state he said he prayed oh lord forgive them for they know not what they do so what generates this state of mind the buddha would radiate such peace around him that for a radius of 2 miles you could know he is there just by the vibrations in the atmosphere the peacefulness the stillness and the awareness one would feel in his presence and shri ramakrishna well his states of samadhi were so frequent that the people who were in his room were always you know prepared for it he hardly needed an excuse to go into samadhi when he went into it everybody felt the impact of that state their minds would just calm down when it was bhava samadhi they would be imbued with that divine emotion and as if a mob of you know half crazy people would be created there crazy with divine consciousness so what generates these very high elevated states of consciousness this is a really a, a tremendous study and i'm so glad princeton gave me this topic the art of spiritual practice there's a huge science to it so let's go deeply into it i would say the very first thing required for spiritual practice is a state of sattva or inner tranquility and harmony a disturbed mind cannot bring these states nor retain them even if they come in so how do we attain that state of sattva that is why you see it, it is uh, so difficult to explain these concepts to young students this is what makes it difficult i i work with only young people i am teaching a whole lot of iitians you just heard uh, heard it in the introduction so many of them are absolutely concentrated and focused youngsters but when it comes to the level of sattva that is really deeply in question because in their restlessness they are trying to somehow control and focus extremely restless minds young young minds but if this element of sattva comes into us and how do I, i don't know really how to translate these words from sanskrit sattva actually means deep inner tranquility and harmony calmness of mind and when that is there a, a certain stillness prevails in the entire system as a result of which awareness a deeper awareness dawns in the mind when there is stillness there is awareness when there's too much noise you can feel it anywhere the the awareness goes so there's a deep connection between the calmness and tranquility of our mind and the unfoldment of awareness so that is why the first precondition and you know all these pre qualifications of yoga fall under this it is to manufacture a sattvic state of mind absolutely necessary for spiritual practice you can just know things for yourself which means the first person research into consciousness is possible if there is a sattvic state of mind and this is how we are doing consciousness research i don't have time to tell you about that maybe in the q and a session i can tell you but a lot of research is going on on the signs of consciousness and how to discover the deepest uh, levels of consciousness we are capable of so this is the first point which i wanted to mention and the second most important thing is our ability to stall thoughts 
our ability to stall thinking pause thinking so the the very uh, starting of the patanjali yoga sutras you know how they begin i can give you the first four sutras here they start with atha yoga anushasanam now we begin the study of yoga the second sutra says yoga stu chitta vritti nirod yoga means the cessations of the incessant modifications of the mind why should you do that why is it important because the third sutra says tada drashta swarupe avasthanam so that the witnessing awareness is able to go back to its source so that the witnessing awareness can come to the forefront of your mind and thoughts can recede so you must develop the technique to stop thought at least temporarily pause your thinking thought process and otherwise what would happen that's the fourth sutra telling you vritti sarupyam itaratra otherwise you will be just carried away by your thoughts now you see how scientific this what they are telling us is it's absolutely scientific they are telling us that if you don't develop this technique of stalling mind thought you will be carried away by your thoughts and you you sort of get mixed up with them you are so invested in them the the awareness is just a mental concept it's not a feeling you don't it's not a felt reality with you so this is the problem in yoga that we think even awareness is a thought it's a concept it is not a concept it is not a thought it is what you get when you empty mind of thought am i right check your mind and tell me is this making sense yes so the very beginning of yoga the i i told you the first four sutras it is about emptying mind what happens when you empty mind in a perfectly conscious state your awareness will increase you will become deeply aware than identified with some silly thought process taking you just away from your goals so this state is a very powerful state it's it's completely first person research please see you you're doing it it's your awareness that is coming out and you will understand this is the very powerful state because your vital energies just get renewed when you are able to enter this state and you cannot study it in the third person you cannot study it through an fmri scan although the fmri scan will give you the clue that the meditative state gives very high gamma radiation and with distributed phase symmetry so uh, you are in a meditative state it will give you that clue but it is a felt reality in your consciousness when you stop the thought process in a completely conscious state and for a considerable period of time at least for a few seconds if you can do this you will become deeply aware without a thought process in this state what do you exactly feel you feel the meditative awareness you are there scintillating with the luminosity of awareness but without a thought without a vritti a modification of mind and it is an absolutely blissful state to be in because once you are out of it you understand its value once you are out of it you understand what a powerful state it was so this is yoga when i use the word yoga in this presentation i am referring to this meditative state i am not referring to those exercises those asanas so this state has to be cornered and studied and the the best research you can conduct into this is the research in the first person which means the practice of meditation all these elevated states of the masters becomes possible when we enter the realm of yoga when we understand something by awareness which is not in the third person you understand it by yourself what it means and how powerful this state is and all of the indian spiritual heritage is concentrated on making this state uh, showing us the importance and value of this state so you have it in all almost all our scriptures you know even in bhakti scriptures in the uh, mythologies in the uh, you know the samudra manthan story and all that they are they are supposed to be mythical stories or uh, just stories invented to tell us some important uh, value 
but um, they are actually pointing to the meditative state and telling you the importance of that state so how many of you know the story of the churning of the ocean samudra manthan oh most of you know it good that makes my task easy <laughs> so what is that story exactly telling us please see there is this periodic quarrel between the devas and the asuras and their uh, the the number of devas uh, because they are dying their number is decreasing so they run to vishnu the godhead and tell him that please uh, give us a means uh, to become immortal uh, make us immortal so he says then you have to acquire that amrit uh, that is the uh, drinking which that nectar drinking which you will become immortal now this is a kind of allegory a kind of story trying to tell you you require to churn your mind and dive into the self to become truly immortal immortal in the sense not that your body lives forever but you touch the self which ever lives which is ever there which is eternal in nature and the body and mind is just what your self is working through it's it's something like the clothes we wear so self knowledge is being uh, described as the nectar of immortality in this story so what's the method for that so vishnu tells them you have to churn the ocean and uh, for that the ocean is nothing but our minds meditation is churning the mind churning the ocean to get the amrit to get immortality so then they acquire uh, they they these two have to unite you know these devas and asuras because uh, the devas represent our good thoughts the asuras represent our bad thoughts but you need the whole mind to be able to meditate nobody ever meditated with a part of his mind it's not possible you have to bring all the forces the entire vital energy to play uh, for meditation to become possible and that is why the this the story says that the devas and asuras shook hands and decided to churn the ocean in order to get amrit and then what happened they acquired a, a churning rod it was mount meru and that symbolizes it is symbolic of your spine the spine is the axis of the universe because it is along the spine that the highest vital energy can flow which makes your mentation and perceptions possible so is it's the it's the spine that is being described as the mountain meru and then the rope the vasuki snake is nothing but the kundalini shakti again the arousal of your vital energy uh, and its flow upward so that you unfold the deepest levels of awareness this is a you know it's a paradigm from the tantras and the yoga yoga shastra just to tell us that if you handle your vital energies properly you can unfold the highest awareness i'll be showing you graphs on all this because today we have uh, converted it to a whole lot of um, uh, we have formulated courses on this uh, in the language of science so i'll be showing that to you but the idea is this that you can there is a, there are means to unfold the highest awareness and one mean uh, one way of doing it is to uh, commit your vital energies along those higher chakras so that you can manifest the highest consciousness so then the churning began and all sorts of things came up isn't it first there were all those precious gems and pearls coming out of the ocean what it means to say is all all the, your good feelings and uh, consolations and reflections and good emotions devotion all this will come out of your mind when you churn it but at some point even halahal will come out the poison and then who who gulped up the poison it was lord shiva self knowledge will dissolve the ahalahal this is what it, they mean to say and they are putting it in like that and then um then uh, mother lakshmi comes up you know the wealth of your mind your power of attention and creativity and anything that you have within you will just come out will manifest that is the wealth of your mind and then uh, a whole lot of things come out finally the amrit comes and then there's a kind of a, a fight between the devas and the asuras but vishnu comes and solves the problem and makes sure he empowers only the devas with amrit so here vishnu stands for our higher intelligence or what is called the dhi dhi shakti uh, in in the scriptures it's used as dhi it only means the higher 
intelligence which is able which actually is able to uh, uh, make this difference between pure awareness and mind so it knows what to empower whom to empower so it will empower your awareness deepening which you come to the state of pure consciousness or the amrit this is the story of uh, it's actually the depicting the entire process of yoga but in the form of a um, allegorical story so this is uh, all pervasive in indian um, spiritual uh, literature this these kind of stories now i would like to go into what is required in order to come to this level of meditation see they are very clear about it you know the pre qualifications are huge in both yoga and vedant uh, i would just like to mention them before i show them to you on a ppt the actual uh, scheme of yoga so in in uh, yoga uh, yoga sutras you have these yama and niyam these are the pre qualifications since we are going to study the art of spiritual practice these are the preliminaries so it 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 involves first ahimsa we know the words i think ahimsa you know very well it means a non violent mind a, a very calm mind a peaceful mind satya the ability to stick to truth asteya asteya is actually non covetousness non stealing which means not appropriating to the ego what does not belong to one so all this will stop this outward going tendency of the mind and then you have brahmacharya uh, which is uh, chastity and uh, continence this is practiced in order to keep your vital energies at a particular level and that helps in the unfoldment of the highest awareness that is why this discipline uh, celibacy is insisted upon in all religions for this simple reason that it is your vital energy that ultimately helps you unfold the highest awareness and then aparigraha aparigraha again means um, not taking gifts or uh, not you know to keep your karmic account clear not taking what you don't require and then shaucha uh, this is the niyama discipline which is cleanliness of body and mind you have santosha which is uh, contentment tapas some amount of austerity it will keep your vital energies vibrant it, it's so very important the austere life you know a whole lot of my students by themselves have adopted to this uh, in their own way and they stand up and tell me so boldly that mataji this keeps our energies in full flow just the practice of these disciplines so tapasya austerity means that it comes from tap dhatu to heat up heat up what heat up the energy that has been given to you so that you are able to acquire the highest knowledge so this is tapas mandatory to spiritual discipline practice and then you have swadhyay some amount of uh, uh, deep knowledge of the scriptures uh, a daily kind of uh, exposure to the scriptures because you know the vrittis of your mind have to be spiritualized the modifications of our mind that is why dwelling on all this becomes very important and then ishwar pranidhan which is of course devotion and surrender to the divine so these are mandatory preliminary disciplines of yoga required for spiritual practice and um vedanta has its own set of <laughs> preliminary disciplines what is called the sadhan chatushthay i will briefly just mention it here the first discipline there is uh, vivek which is philosophical discretion between what is real what is unreal what is temporary what is permanent and you know leaning towards what is eternal and permanent which is vairagya which means um actually it is translated as uh, detachment but actually what it means to say is you are investing in the higher life you are investing your vital energies into that which is permanent and more satisfying and then uh, you have the shat sampati the group of six qualities uh, which uh, very much help us uh make the spiritual life real and vibrant so these six qualities include shama deep inner calmness dhamma sense control uparati ability to withdraw mind and focus it on our goals withdraw mind from objects and ability to focus it titiksha 
the diksha is the ability to bear with everything forbearance because you know if we are too impatient we will nullify our efforts so titiksha and then shraddha shraddha is astikya buddhi shankaracharya says it it's so beautiful it's a positive affirmative state of mind where you take things properly you have deep faith in what you are doing that is shraddha absolutely required for spiritual practice and then you have samadhan which is deep focus the mind riveted to the goal without this form of focus you can't get this so even the method of inquiry which we do in vedant depends on this that's why you know in in the indian spiritual heritage usually the way is from yog to vedant you bring great stability to the mind through the practice of yog all these steps and then you enter into real meditative inquiry and the practice of shravan manan and nididhyasan so it serves as a stepping stone towards uh, the the actual goal of vedant which is the realization of brahman or pure consciousness what we say so see this, all this may uh, make it look like oh it's quite complicated it's a huge scheme we have to pass through not so you know because if you really want the goal if you really want it you will have it you will find your way to it the fourth uh, uh, discipline in sadhan chatushtha is mumukshutvam if you have this you will have everything else mumukshutvam is the great yearning to know the truth as it is who doesn't have this tell me which means we have the all these other preliminaries you know sort of inherent intrinsic to our consciousness they are there waiting to be practiced waiting to come out so don't get frightened with all the pre qualifications i always tell my students that is being told to you so that you attain to a certain amount of harmony and balance in your everyday life just aim at the goal that is the most important thing so now this is what we are going to do we are going to go into the practice uh because i as i told you the the actual art of spiritual practice we will be knowing all the theory about it but practice is practice it has ultimately to be done to be known and the nature of this experience is you know it by being by being it you cannot know it as an object so there is no method of knowledge i can use inquiry i can keep arguing and you know doing shravan mana nididhyas and all my life but it will only come to you as a very powerful insight in a state of meditative awareness it will come to you like that so to be able to generate that uh, let me go into this ppt yes i always give these examples as a preliminary slide you look at their level of intelligence and awareness and you will see that obviously this is the the highest evolution of the human being they radiated a level of consciousness which could transform minds just like that we know how difficult it is to transform our child isn't it to change the mind of our children they transformed millions and they continue to do so what kind of a mind was that and what realization was that so they have exuded and radiated the highest level of intelligence and bliss and how this was made possible we will go into it see i told you the preliminary pre qualifications of yoga but i want to take you actually through the yogic process um described by patanjali he calls it the basic scheme of the patanjali yoga sutras and then there is an advanced scheme what do these uh, the actual uh, discipline of yoga take us into what does it bring for us so this is the basic scheme of the patanjali yoga sutras please watch this slide here yoga sees it like this it sees our problem to be of course ignorance but due to what due to the coming together of purusha and prakriti consciousness and mind have got mixed up just now check and see this is how we think of our we think we are mind body and mind consciousness well others spe are speaking of it but we don't know what it is so this is the coming together of purusha and prakriti in the language of yoga purusha stands for consciousness 
and prakriti stands for mind and of course all the other evolutes of the mind and the coming together of purusha and prakriti generates avidya ignorance you don't know the nature of the self or consciousness as it is this is avidya and the way to overcome this avidya patanjali says is through the understanding of kleshas avidya actually generates klesha means afflictions of mind afflictions they are of the nature of attachment fear anger he he calls them avidya rag dvesh abhinivesh all these hatred negativity is in the mind this constant overflow of thought and we don't know how to stop it and a whole lot of negativities all this falls under kleshas so deep within you know somebody said most men live lives of quiet desperation deep within we feel that and the weight out of this also that is why it is described and you know the mind can really create a hell out of heaven and a heaven out of hell we all know that and that's why the importance of the patanjali yoga sutras it actually is a wonderful manual on mind management and it gives you such deep uh, ideas on mind management uh, some of which i will tell you here you know one famous uh, humorist he once said my life is full of disasters none of which ever happened <laughs> that's the nature of the mind you you just thought your th- your thoughts made your life so miserable and you can't stop them so this is the state of kleshas you know afflicted mind how to overcome this that is why the ashtang yoga this is how he describes it patanjali ashtang yoga is the preliminary discipline towards the attainment of samadhi in the patanjali yoga sutras see i have condensed a lot of information into these slides uh so it's packed with information actually ashtang yoga what are the steps of ashtang yoga it starts with yam niyam then you have asan which is your ability to sit for long periods of time in complete stillness pranayam your ability to regulate breath breathing and then after that you have um uh, yam niyam asan pranayam pratyahar ability to withdraw your mind and focus it on your object of meditation then you have dharana dharana is that state where there is uninterrupted single thought flow single track thought flow towards one object not the four tracks which are usually running you know yes single track that is dharana and dhyan means pratyaya ekatanata dhyanam beautiful definition of patanjali yoga sutra it means your thought as it were got riveted on the object doesn't move from there a, a long drawn out thought you can say on the object so the object has absolutely occupied your field of awareness there is no distinction between you and the object now and if this state of dhyan continues for 144 seconds which is no joke it will be samadhi dhyan itself becomes samadhi so that radiant attention with which only the object of your meditation reigns in your mind and you're absolutely dissolved into it absorbed in it that is samadhi and this is a state of the highest awareness it's called pragna by patanjali it is a special type of knowledge you know prakrishtena gnyan that which gives you the a special very very elevated kind of knowledge is pragna so meditation please remember should not end up in sleep it's happening to many people i'm so sorry to say but meditation should yield the highest awareness that is the purpose of the meditative state your awareness just unfolds completely and this state is so powerful the state of pragna that you know just like that without thinking without objective data collected from somewhere 
<laughs> so all other forms of knowledge compared to this, they, they take it as secondary, you know. In the Patanjali, actually in the commentaries, you will find that. Why Brahma Vidya Sarva Vidya Pradishtam is for this reason, you just know. There's no explanation to how, how you know. You have become so full potent with uh, scintillating awareness, the luminosity of pure being, that you just know everything in that state. It is the highest form of knowledge. That is why it's called pragna. So samadhi, the state of samadhi is the culmination of ashtang yoga. The purpose of yoga is this, not just good health, mental peace. <laughs> That's all by the way. You know, it's okay. But the highest knowledge is the goal. And then, this is not all. You know, in the scheme of Patanjali Yoga Sutras, this basic scheme is just, again, just the first part. Let me go to the next one. See, the advanced scheme of Patanjali Yoga Sutra is once you enter the state of Samadhi, you have entered Sampragnat Yoga. From here begins the advanced scheme of Patanjali Yoga Sutras. What does Sampragnat mean? It means with Pragna. Now, whatever you do, whatever you see, whatever you hold in your mind, it will be with that Pragna. That Pragna never leaves you. It's an awakened awareness or consciousness. It will never leave you. You have a different perception altogether to anything because of this pragna. It's a kind of inner light shining forth all the time. So some prag you enter some pragna yoga and the, the next step to this is a more uh, you know, concentrated form of pragna called Ritambara pragna. The very meaning of Ritambara is very interesting. It means truth bearing intuition. It is a knowledge or a, an insight which gives you the whole truth of your being in that state. This is Ritambara Pragna. It's a state of supreme knowledge. This is all you can, we can say from this. You see, words and mind cannot describe this. Thoughts and uh, words. Raman Marshi used to say, words are the great-grandfathers of, uh, I mean, great-grandsons of this state. <laughs> this state is the great-grandfather. You can't, they can't describe it. How, how can words describe this? So, Ritambara Pragna is the most powerful state of pure being where you develop Vivekhyati. Vivekhyati is that stage where you are able to clearly discern awareness from Buddhi, from the higher intelligence. That is thinking, discriminating, uh, discerning. It is, you are able to see the nature of pure awareness clearly. You are able to distinguish awareness from the buddhi sattva. This is the state of vivekhyati. And that is why you come to the conclusion, Brahma Satyam Jagad Mithya, you come to the conclusion that indeed this is the highest knowledge. Vivekhyati yields that level of understanding. And Thence you enter a sampragnyat yoga, which means even the level of pragna which you generated is a small thing now. You are fully enveloped in the state of divine consciousness. And you transcend the normal limitations of knowledge. You know, all knowledge has epistemic limits. Do you know it? We think in time, space and causation and the mind itself is bound and we are searching for the ultimate reality through, through such equipment. So this will break all these barriers, Asampragnyat Yoga, and usher you into the state of Kaivalya. Kaivalya means the separation of Purusha and Prakriti, so that Keval Purusha remains. You have separated consciousness from the mind stuff. Only pure consciousness reigns. Kevala Chaitanya. That is Kaivalya. That is the aim and end of yoga. So, you have effectively separated Prakriti and Purusha. This is how it is seen in yoga. In, in other words, you have attained what you truly are. You have attained who you truly are. You are pure being of the nature of existence, consciousness and bliss. You attain to that. 
but this is the scheme step by step you know actually patanjali yoga sutras it is sutra it is they are aphorisms you can put them in one a4 page but they are potent and packed with knowledge so much of knowledge that the commentaries on patanjali yoga sutras are this big yes it will take you a lifetime actually to go through that you know i study all this after my meditation um, every day after my um, uh, morning meditations i just sit with these big volumes and it makes so much of sense suddenly you know what they are saying is something so deep and meaningful that i i have come to the conclusion this is the highest knowledge uh, really worthy of princeton <laughs> these great citadels of knowledge should value this this form of subjective knowledge very much because you know this is about our consciousness what is the point in knowing everything about the world and not knowing who i am tell me we know what's happening on jupiter just now and beyond that also that that voyager is sending us all the data all the news but i don't know what is my awareness about who i am what an irony so this knowledge addresses these questions that is why you see these are all very powerful systems but i don't have much time let me go into the next slide the practice of samadhi yields superlative happiness let's go through vivekananda what he says on this vivekananda says when a minute portion of energy travels along a nerve fiber and causes reaction the perception is either dream or imagination but when by the, by the power of long internal meditation the vast mass of energy stored up travels along the sushumna and strikes the centers the reaction is tremendous immensely more intense than the reaction of sense perception it is super sensuous perception this is samadhi this is what it brings to you now there's a correspondence theory to this each level of your energy yields a different level of consciousness the first three levels what what is what are these levels about i want you to know they are junction points where you can concentrate vital energies so if you go to your internet they will give you all sorts of ideas about chakras and this and it's they are junction points where you can concentrate vital energies you can do it yourself and the the idea is the first three levels give you only body consciousness and only a level of sensual joy the fourth level relieves one of body consciousness that's the anahata level the level of the heart relieves one of body consciousness and hence happiness here has to do with intellectual joy and the joy of higher awareness so also the higher the level the subtler happier and purer the dimension of your experience so whichever model we use for every tier of higher awareness there is a corresponding level of happiness and as we move upward we realize we are moving inward you are interiorizing your consciousness every tier yields a fixed level of fulfillment any activity on the tier will yield the same level of fulfillment so fulfillment is not activity related but awareness related this is the big theory of yoga which has been which you will find in various ways in different systems but all it means to say is handle your vital energies properly so as to manifest the highest levels of awareness now let me go into the conclusions of yoga as a result see these are graphs i created for those iitians because they understand it this way only <laughs> so the, the first is the graph of happiness against time usually we have a base level of happiness a baseline of happiness it's called and it is at different levels in uh, different people and when good things happen well okay you enjoyed it and you came back to the base level when bad things happen again you go up to the base level now what yoga does for you the practice of meditation does for you is first of all it will regulate this mood fluctuation it will uh, bring you into a fairly equanimous state of mind and it will increase the base line of happiness itself so you are raising the bar of happiness actually uh, through awareness through yoga this is the science of spiritual practice this is what it does for you and then go to graph b see it is telling you the function between awareness and vital energy if you systematically raise vital energy in your own system through those the i told you the means your awareness will unfold 
automatically because when you are vitally alive full of vitality you have a deep sense of awareness please check this out and see your we know everything about external energies we don't know much about vital energy as i'm telling you so that is why this is a very important this is the graph of sadhana when you commit vitality vital energy in a specific way and develop the technique to raise it you will unfold the highest awareness and the c and d are the graphs showing you the connection between happiness and awareness you know the happiness is nothing but an exponential function of your awareness the higher your awareness gets the happier you will be and the lower your awareness the more worry and fear and negativities can assault your mind find place in your mind isn't this true obviously the clarity of our awareness ensures our happiness so happiness is an exponential function of your awareness that is depicted in those two graphs so uh, with my students i always tell them that that uh, you see you want to be you want to lead the happy life that's why everything all the striving so understand these fundamental equations and you will uh, be able to manufacture happiness right from within you you will get the capacity to do that because if you only rely on synthetic joys which means you require the mobile to keep you engaged and youtube to keep you entertained <laughs> then at some point you will get fed up with that you will get bored with it and what if you don't have the gadget you will go into depression so better to try to find out how i can remain happy within myself by myself these are the graphs which uh, are are telling us all this so there's a lot more to say about this but i have limited time and uh, vinit ji is right here ready for the q and a so let me just go to the next slide i want to go into this the science of sadhana in vedant we use the method of inquiry isn't it inquiry and meditation both nididhyasan to know so how exactly is it done i am putting it into three slides and showing you these slides how to know the knower the first thing is what we are calling avritta chakshu the inward turned mind how do you generate that turning the light within will mean turning the light of awareness to its source so so the first way of doing that is you shut out the modifications of your mind so that your mind does not go outward that is why you the practices of yoga the second is you work to intensify chida bhas or reflected consciousness in the mind which means how to make the mind more aware and all spiritual practices meant for this please know all spiritual practices meant for this how to become more aware than identified with something so the empty mind filled with awareness is the secret i told you how to generate that and vedanta will tell you you see none of these methods will actually lead you to the source only you must clean the lens <laughs> clean the mind so clean it up that it will the light will sparkle the light of your own awareness shri ramkrishna used to give this formula pure mind is equal to pure buddhi is equal to pure atman you know the atman just when the mind becomes totally clean and clear and if the if the mind is turbid for me you can't get it just like a lake if the if the surface is not wavy and the water is clean not turbid you can see what is at the bottom of the lake just like that so you see generating the pure aham pratyay will reflect the pure self and this is how you can know the self what does this mean the i sense within us is called the aham pratyay the sense of i now you please check and see do it right now the sense of i within you can it stay without any attribute without any upadhi without thinking oh i am a professor of princeton i am such and such i have this family i am so and so i was born without all this can it stay by itself who am i without all this can you track that that is called the aham pratyay the pure i i in itself so if you are able to generate this pure aham pratyay it will reflect the nature of the self this is what this is telling us 
this is actually vedant see now if i ask you a simple question do you find your body in your awareness or awareness in your body come on tell me you find your body in your awareness so what does this imply your awareness is primary you are finding your body and your thoughts in your awareness so awareness is primarily i then this is what they are telling you the pure aham is awareness you are your you being mr so and so miss so and so is all secondary that's the personality which you wear like we wear our clothes but that's not the real you the unchanging you is this pure aham pratyay so if you can generate it and maintain it if you can generate it and maintain it through meditative practice you will come to the knowledge of the self this is the idea so any enquiry into the self will follow this kind of a method hmm? can i ask you one more question hmm? see are you aware of the body or is the body aware of you tell me you are aware of the body and are you aware of your thoughts or your thoughts in some way are aware of you you are aware of the thoughts so what does this mean tell me i am aware of my body my body is not aware of me indeed that's the fact about our experience that means awareness is primarily me and i find my body and mind in my awareness this is how you experience life but you know the ego has sometimes become it becomes so big that we start thinking no i am primarily a personality a person an individual individuality is really big big burden and then i am thinking of awareness you are not thinking of awareness you are thinking in awareness am i right am i making sense yes so you see awareness is our primary nature and you can catch it in its purest form just through these techniques this is the key difference between ordinary perception and self knowledge see in ordinary perception what we call paroksha anubhuti it is based on vrittis which means thoughts about objects but self knowledge is entirely aham pratyay based it is based on cornering and tracking the pure eye sense within you the path of raman maharshi koham who am i he asked then the medium of perception in paroksha anubhuti is very dense the mind can have all sorts of thoughts but in self knowledge the medium is absolutely clear and becomes like a mirror clarity of mind the practice of yoga and meditation that is why is important for inquiry to work for you and then paroksha anubhuti is about intermittent awareness because you know it's partially invested in the thought process yes you are interested in your thoughts your thoughts are enlivened by that awareness so you are involved in the thought process but aparoksha anubhuti is there is no intermittent awareness there is complete blossoming of awareness because you put down the thought process itself and paroksha anubhuti that's why it's mediated knowledge heavily mediated by a whole lot of factors including your equipment but aparoksha anubhuti is unmediated knowledge that is why it is a paroksha anubhuti it's immediate unmediated self knowledge is like that you you just become what you always were are and will be it is knowing by being its existence itself so atma vichar which means self enquiry seeks to find the foundations of self awareness by penetrating into the immediate and incontrovertible experience of one's existence as the ego it is an intuitive process leading to direct mystical experience see this is the difference between if you just ask yourself what gives me the feel of an experience well, now when we we just went out uh, to see some of the buildings and what is it that makes me distinguish so many shades of gray i could see 10 shades of gray there you go into that park you'll see 100 shades of green 
What gives me the feel of an experience? It's my awareness. It's my awareness. A non-living entity can, can inform, cannot experience. That chat GPT lady, you know her well? Yes, you ask her. Uh, do you ex you know a whole lot of things? She is so creative. My God, how she can turn out original things! Uh, and you just ask her. You're so magnificent. But tell me, do you experience what you know? And she will say, I am only programmed to inform and not to experience. <laughs> She'll tell you that because she has no self awareness. But we are self aware, so we experience. And the feel of an experience is due to the presence of pure consciousness within you. This is what I'm trying to say. So the nature of consciousness, both consciousness and bliss, are afterglows of a unitary experience of pure being. It's beautifully described by Shankaracharya as Sva Samvedya Svayam Prakashatvat. It is the only experience that does not require proof. By its own effulgence, it is self-evident. Tell me, do you require a torch to see the sun? Do you? In fact, the torch lights up the solar batteries of, I mean, the sun lights up the solar batteries of your torch. Helps you see things. So you don't require anything to see the self, but a pure, clear mind. The pure aham pratyay will take you into that. The experience itself cannot be captured objectively. The experiencer resolves into pure being during the experience. That is why the experience of Samadhi is all absorbing. When the mind and prana move, the world of objects takes shape. And when he comes out of it, he concludes in comparison that it was the state of the highest bliss. That is why it is an all absorbing experience and considered the, uh, the very culmination of the human evolutionary process. Once somebody asked Sri Ramakrishna, what do you exactly feel in Samadhi? What do you feel? And Sri Ramakrishna kept quiet for some time and then said, if I said, if a small fish was released from a pot, a small pot into the ocean, how would he feel? Uh, would this mean something to you then? Would you understand this way? It's a complete liberation of mind. No more epistemic limits. Your consciousness reaches its source. In fact, you are always that. And as a result, you know where to place your personality, how to drop off the unnecessary content of your mind. How to keep a really clear... When you have a clear mind, uh, full of awareness, you really enjoy life, isn't it? Hmm? And if we have a, a totally uh, cluttered mind, how does that feel? Even your cluttered room, you so many teenagers move out of their room into the guest room because their room is too cluttered. Mind is like that. Our getaways, you know, <laughs> it's, it's some, something similar. We plan our getaways because we want to get out of the mind. So we know where to place the experiences of life once we are able to manufacture these highest, higher states of consciousness. I will conclude with one beautiful example from Raman Maharshi. How many of you have read him? Yes, excellent. See, he, he could not sign his name. And there were all sorts of people coming to him and asking him for an autograph. Now, how does such a person give, give a signature? He doesn't even remember his name. Because that, that mind which has touched this level of consciousness understands its personalities very differently. It actually appears like an object. It doesn't equate with the self. So he, he could not remember his name. And sometimes he would sign Om. And then still they would pester him. Oh, please put your signature. So one fine day he, he wrote a beautiful couplet there instead of Om. It's so beautiful. It's so touching. He wrote, Ekam aksharam ridi nirantaram bhasate swayam likhyate katham. One akshar, imperishable word or reality, sh ever shining effulgent in my heart. Bhasate swayam, by itself, self-luminous. 
likhya de kadam how do i put it down on paper what do you expect me to become <laughs> it is not becoming it is pure being you can only know see sadhana is like that it takes you back into who you truly are you become what you always were but this commotion and all the confusion created by the mind this has to be somehow tackled and put down whole purpose of sadhana is it is to do with your mind you know there's this beautiful couplet in sanskrit that both ignorance and knowledge are in the mind mukti is in the mind and bondage is in the mind liberation is in the mind bondage is in the mind so take care of the mind and we have a lot of techniques to go into this so let us never say that we didn't know how to do this they are all available and there are masters who have demonstrated this who have been able to do this even a bit of this knowledge coming into our lives will uh, convince us that knowledge can be acquired to this depth and this is really completely fulfilling knowledge it gives you complete inner bliss and fulfillment a kind of satisfaction which you know even going to mars would not get you that kind of satisfaction although you are breaking a lot of uh, these limits by doing that this is a, sat a knowledge which brings you complete satisfaction self fulfillment so this is the presentation i had wanted to make here regarding the art of sadhana we can take up questions i hope i am on time before we transition into the next portion of our evening let's show our appreciation and give a big round of applause <laughs> to Mata ji so at this time i'd like to call on uh, dr nick vogue to come forward and share a brief reflection and response to mata ji's discourse tonight and get us started for those who can stay for a brief Q&A session. Hmm. Maybe you can come forward to the podium. Um, well, I'm honored and thrilled to get a chance to uh, listen to you and learn from you. Uh, I came today for myself to work on my practice. I'm fascinated, as an academic might be, by the philosophy the limits and possibilities of our epistemologies. Uh, and that's exciting to me. That's thrilling to me. But right now, what I'm feeling is what a glimpse of what that takes us toward. To be filled up with the experience of direct luminosity. It's such powerful language and phrases that use it kind of gave me a <laughs> jolt of energy. I don't know if other people felt that there are certain yeah. phrases that yeah, just yeah. resonated. I, I was so anxious to capture them all. Um, <laughs> what I came today was to focus on the art, the practice. In my own practice, I've been studying. Love the study. What I'm working on is the practice of, to implement that with the techniques the day to day, to have the direct experience of and embody that, internalize that, and feel that for glimpses of moments described how you meditate first and then you study in the pot. I've been able to do the study part. <laughs> um, the study part. The transition to the practice is what brought me here today. And so your example excites me. Your example is, inspires me. And then again, I felt I had a, a glimpse like I've never had before of what that looks like and then what's the effect of that. So I want to thank you. Um, one of the things I was thinking about as I was listening, as I'm an educator, I work with, like you, I've seen your videos, with young people today, Princeton students. And I think this the self-inquiry that you're talking about, the self-knowledge that is uh, so important is also so difficult, I think, for young people right now to look inward. Um, and then in the university where we value, as you said, this external knowledge, there's another force that maybe pulls the attention away. And it's useful and it's powerful. Um, so one thing I occurred to me was I was thinking is there's the methods and techniques, but I, I wonder how do we as educators help um, these young people have the confidence 
to look inward, the confidence for that inquiry that, because they could look out there, and they are looking out there, but how do we help them gain the confidence to, to look in, is my question to you to start. Uh, how do we make them do this, give them the confidence to take up this inquiry? See, this is what I do with my students, I can, I can tell you this. Um, I use examples from their own lives and help them think how, uh, how they can practically apply something of this. Like, for example, my students are very fond of selfies. <laughs> so I tell them, when you are clicking, uh, when you have clicked your selfie and you're admiring it, just think about it. Who is seeing what? Okay, you are admiring your selfie. And who is seeing what? So they'll say, uh, Mataji, I, my mind is seeing my body. Who sees your mind? My intellect. Who sees that intellect? Then they will say, awareness. So then, you are the self, not the selfie. <laughs> You are the awareness in which this entire thing is happening. So this is how I try to draw examples from their own experiences because um, students, I told you, the problem is there's too much energy there and uh, they don't know where to direct it. And that's why, uh, but a whole lot of people are deeply interested in this, I can tell you that. In fact, you know, uh, they have a meditation hall there uh, in NRCV where many students sit and meditate. Yes. Because I told them that unless you are able to meditate, you will not catch this. This is pure first-person existential research. The science of consciousness is like that. So no point showing me fMRI scans of what your brain was doing. <laughs> I, I'm not going to believe in that. I want to feel the meditative vibration within you, the calmness and the composure and the stability of your mind. If that is there, you will naturally penetrate into this knowledge. You will get it. At least you will value it. Uh, you will understand it and value it above everything else. And that has happened. You know, a whole lot of my students, many of them are in the US just now. They tell me that this was the course they actually remember <laughs> from their tenure in IIT. They just remember this course because it was on self-knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, please. That's right. It's teenagers. That's right. Can we just wait until you get the microphone just so we can get it on? In this country, as well as in India, the suicidal rate among the teenagers is increasing every year. Right, right. So how this knowledge can be really made available to them in simple yeah. terms which will help them? Yeah, yeah, that's why we are formulating courses on mind management. Uh, it's not exactly self-knowledge, but mind management. How to manage your mind fundamentally. And especially, you see, all uh, mental health problems can be traced to emotional insecurities. So these teenage years, they pass through a whole lot of uh, emotions which they are not able to handle. How to bring uh, some amount of stability there? How to develop emotional intelligence? See, from this self-knowledge um, canvas, you can draw, formulate a whole lot of courses on mind management, emotional intelligence, and we are doing that. I'm actually working with five universities doing all this, and I, I'm the syllabus creator there, you know, creating the syllabus for these, uh, formulating these courses, and they are floating them in every semester because suicidal rates in IIT are high, as, as you said. And you know where they shoot themselves? When it comes to suicide, they shoot it themselves here because they want to stop the mind. So mind management must be made compulsory, mandatory in all universities, not just about counseling, but how really to manage mind. What are the factors and the, the, the functional classification of the mind, the structural cl classification, all this must become common knowledge. This is the whole purpose of the science of consciousness, actually. How to live a complete life, a full life. 
so we are trying to do all this i think it would be very beneficial if it is introduced in universities here also and definitely there can be an exchange of information from both sides we can work on it together yes thank you so much for this uh, wonderful full of knowledge you talk thank you madam uh, just one question i always wonder this is so important as you rightly say that going to mars and all of course it's important but this knowledge of self what age group you look at it to when to start this knowledge because with whatever little experience yes. and whatever i have you know gathered around and stu studied that if this knowledge is given even at a very younger age yes that mind is very tender yes maybe not ready to mm. you know have it so which age group or you know just if you can just the younger the better <laughs> no the so younger means like 10 years 12 years yeah even 9 8 9 10 okay. is should be perfectly fine some uh, level of uh, exposure to upanishads and that there is such a knowledge available to us and the inspirational uh, life of great masters if this much can be introduced to them i think it will make a huge difference and children are very sensitive in fact i know of one child uh he was just i think 9 uh 9 year old um he went on asking me but who am i actually <laughs> so his parents and everyone told him you are whatever ramesh or whatever his name was and uh, you are our child and but actually who am i so some sense of his pure being has come into him otherwise how can he put a question like this so children are very sensitive only thing is uh a little more information on all this if it goes into them at that tender age and they are able to do um, what we call existential enquiry today which means finding the fundamental facts about their existence how do i breathe what is my mind about what is the actual nature of my existence who am i if these kind of questions are answered uh, through the language of vedant it makes a huge difference in the life of the child i would point out to vivekananda vidyapeet here in new jersey they are instilling a whole lot of these kind of values into young people it's very encouraging very inspiring institution yeah <laughs> hi mata ji thank you so much for your time thank your you. presence your inspiration And so I'm an academic at Rutgers University and I'm okay. studying students academic cognition. Okay. So I study this in 9 10 year olds mm -hmm. and what we're finding is their thinking is amazing. Yeah. They're able to articulate thinking about criteria for knowledge that yeah. we haven't seen before. So given that students have this capacity, the metacognition is really advanced. Yeah. What syllabi or curriculum or courses are available for elementary school children? Is there already anything like this? Yeah, there is something like that. In fact, I would really point uh, point out to the syllabus of Vivekananda Vidyapeet okay. because they are uh, handling uh, fourth graders, five, fifth yeah. graders, sixth graders, and with uh, a lot of our scriptural heritage being given to them over the weekends, uh, all the classes are at the weekends. So I will procure that syllabus for you if you wish. Definitely, you can work on that. Yeah. Well, thank you for arranging this. <laughs> this is really great. I've been watching your videos for last for I mean, six, eight, five years maybe. <laughs> Every day in the morning when I do sarvangas and I watch it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I, and I like the new shorts that you're coming out, like the yeah. YouTube shorts. Um, so my my question is sometimes the mind races, keeps on racing, 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 and I've heard that. you know there are techniques to just stop it like the, you yeah, could yeah. try some different different words but uh, i've heard like from shri shri ashram yeah, that they yeah. they've created these techniques that they give you some guru mantra based upon your aura yeah that you you say those mantra once and your thoughts yeah. stop mm -hmm. are you aware of the, any kind of man, mantras or techniques like that that will just like break See, the thoughts yeah i give two techniques mm -hmm. actually um uh you i don't know if you have seen my guided meditation video yes 
there i have i mentioned initially just before you start the meditation two things one is you must regulate your breathing when you slow your breathing you you know your your mind just calms down and the slower you breathe the more the mind will come to rest do you know how many times you breathe every minute <laughs> see we don't know that <laughs> we've been breathing all our life but we don't know how many times we breathe in a minute we breathe about 16 times a minute and when if we are doing a lot of exertion then it's about 17 18 times a minute and you can uh, but a yogi breathes only about 6 to 8 times a minute why how when you are deeply concentrated you will see your breathing comes down to 11 from 16 and if you can reach a stage where really uh, the mind has you will see your breathing has come down to 6 and for the samadhi one you know thakur they could not find his breath when he was in that state so there is a deep connection between breath and mind both are expressions of your vital energy if you want to handle mind and you don't find any other means to do it start breathing deeply first uh, technique second technique is see the way to tackle mind instantly is you must learn to handle your spine properly keep it erect if it droops your vitality will droop yes so learning to handle your spine properly and focusing vital energy at the heart this is a ancient yogic technique to become aware of your present situation to calm down not to be uh, being led away by anger or whatever the situation so if these two techniques are practiced see of course you can get mantras and all that but these are primary they are always with you please see your body is with you all the time so just regulate your breath and keep your back straight the spine should be held straight you see your, your it changes the course of your vital energy in the system the the pranamay kosh has to be kept at a certain vibrancy and you will feel full vitality as a result yes Chris, if you could talk a little bit more. So you talked a lot about these states of samadhi, where you're like, there's no more vrittis, there's no more modifications yes. of mind. But when someone who's been in these states and done a lot of these practices goes out into the world, living their life, talking to people, working, whatever they do, they're obviously going to have thoughts and vrittis. Um, can you talk about what's different in their everyday life by having mm, yeah, those experiences right. and how it translates or goes back? Yeah, home? that's a beautiful question. see once pragna is generated it never leaves you because it is a dimension of your awareness which is very deep it's your own awareness how will it leave you just like how if you have felt a, a real a deep sense of aliveness suppose you went into nature and uh, you just enjoyed a sunset immensely you felt deeply alive can you forget that awareness i'm telling you 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 can't pragna is like that when you are deeply alive which means intensely aware you will never forget that experience so you will carry it with you in any situation of life so all these realized people also did a whole lot of things isn't it look at vivekananda coming to the west and doing so much and uh, thakur of course see how many people visited him he would produce just looking into his eyes people would go into those states chokher chavni they say in bangla which means you just look at the person the look in his eyes will put you into his state of consciousness they had that power raman marshi stood up and built his ashram you know raman marshi who lived in the state of the consciousness of brahman still he was active in work how did they do they carried their pragna with them they never lose it because it's your own awareness how will you ever lose it it has just opened up to a higher dimension and it gives you a bigger slice of life because i told you it affects your vital energy immensely 
there's a deep connection i told showed you that graph connecting vital energy and awareness when awareness is enhanced vital energy will just reverberate within you and if vital energy is worked upon awareness will unfold there's a function between the two so yogis do this do it this way and if you can handle your vitality well you can unfold a very deep level of awareness you will carry that awareness with you it's not like uh, something you know strange or they are living a, a kind of divided life it's nothing like that it's their own awareness which has touched a very deep dimension within themselves so they live a far richer life happier life obviously uh namaste mata ji thank you very much for the talk uh, my question is uh, the hindu scriptures talk about grace of god you need yes. the grace of bhagwan yes how do we invite the grace of god is it through humility or yes. or good deeds how yes. do you invite the grace yes. of god yes all of these which you are saying first of all there must be a karmic backing a, a solid uh, karmic support which means so much of positive karma in our life that it upholds your noble intentions and it brings the grace of god into your life and you can do it by prayer the grace of god comes by humility and prayer when you ask for it see children they want something and they are not getting it how they ask parents isn't it that's a simple technique shri ram krishna uh, described for us just ask him for what you want and you you belong to him it's your birthright so asking in all humility and child like simplicity is a beautiful method so many of our prayers are like that and uh, i think uh, that's the direct way to <laughs> approach the higher reality yeah hari om mata ji and gratitude for your insights today my question is um when we're moving towards cultivating sattva in our lives um in my experience um as i there were certain tendencies that i moved from rajas to sattva but um i think where i am right now is i'm i prefer for my context to be very sattvic which is i, I can't always engineer my context but yet i feel that these sattvic tendencies um although they may be good they are still a bondage and i've tried everything to get out of that so i'm not exactly sure how to go about that is that something i just have to wait and over time it'll just dissolve on its own yeah in an ultimate sense what you say is right you have to overcome sattva also to go into the state of realization but uh, right now as long as there is tamas and rajas lingering in us sattva is to be aimed at this is what i meant without a satvik life you can't actually practice meditation so the problem of how to overcome sattva also comes much later when you are well established in meditation when at, you are at the point of transcendence of body mind through the power of meditation then this question can crop up that how do i overcome all the gunas so how then how do you exactly do it you know yogo yogena gnatavyo yogo yogat pravartate which means that state itself will show you how to transcend it to go to the next state the state of clarity of awareness itself will point out to the next step so first you should attain that you you get it yeah that's the way to move forward your own mind will tell you in that state because it has become so super satvic that it will tell you what next yes Thank you so much. We've arrived at the end of our evening, so this will be the final question. But uh we we want to encourage everyone even if you didn't have an opportunity to ask a question to please follow up. There's so many resources especially online. I'm not I don't get, you know, any commission from YouTube or anything. So um <laughs> please don't think this is all some kind of scheme to get you all on on YouTube and get your information. But we can use even these tools that can sometimes be distractions and pulls but we can also utilize them in the best of ways to cultivate awareness and so right. uh, we're so fortunate that there's so so many teachings 
on YouTube. There are even YouTube shorts because as our attention span gets shorter, we need shorter, you know, snippets and content and 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 content. So um, Mataji is is so giving of her her time and wisdom. Um, so we want to encourage everyone to to you know, make uh, make ample use of that. Um, so I apologize if you didn't get a chance to to ask your question here or to share a reflection, but please, in your own ways, keep the conversations going. So now I'd like to hand it over for one final question, and this will be the last question of the evening. Thank you so much, Madhuji. My, my question is somewhat selfish, small s or capital S. Um, the consciousness and bliss uh, as a unified experience, yes. my sense personally in, in practice is that I am not generating that yes. necessarily from my practice, but releasing myself as if I were a radio tuning into unitary yes. experience. You got it right. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> That's a kind of paradox. But um, uh, th this is a discussion in, uh, with some scientists that I discuss consciousness yeah, with. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, well, no, you're absolutely right because it is already there before you aim at it. It is already there. You're not generating it. Meditation is not a means to generate pure consciousness. It is a means to unfold or uncover the consciousness that is already there. So you are only working on your mind, making your mind all the more clear, pure, so as to reflect the consciousness that already you are. You are already that. I am that. Have you re read the book, I Am That? Nisargadatta Maharaj. Yes, it's so powerful. You are already that. So bringing your mind into a, uh, in, in tune with it, so it perfectly reflects the consciousness and bliss of the self. That is what sadhana is about. That is spiritual practice and that is to be aimed at. <laughs> okay, let us again show our appreciation to Mataji, to Dr. Vogue, <laughs> and to one another for sharing in this amazing space and, and time together. As Mataji rightfully said, especially in, institu in institutes of, of learning, of higher education, we put so much emphasis into um, right. externalizing. Right? We put so much emphasis into investigation, exploration, and examination of all of the objects of knowledge out here but to take even an hour, an hour and a half, to come together, not just individually, but collectively, to come together, to hold community space, to ask these questions, to delve yes. into these things, to have the courage to do that is no small feat. So I am incredibly grateful to all of you for joining us. I hope you're, I wanna encourage you to be grateful to one another because we create that kind of, we hold this space for one another and we wanna encourage you to keep coming back so please, if you haven't already done so, make sure that you do sign in before you leave so we can keep in touch with you, so we can let you know about other events like this, um, and so we can form together constantly, form and reform this community. So thank you again so much. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.